beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through them, and without them not anything was made that was made. In them was life, and the life was the light of all humankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness hasn't overcome it. Let's talk about the Word of God today. Hello, and welcome to my channel. My name is Charlie. I am a non-binary sci-fi fantasy writer who has practiced creation spirituality for over 20 years and is wanting to share with you all that I have learned over that time. The Word of God. This is something that is so easily misunderstood and misused and misappropriated by so many bad actors or misinformed people. And those misconceptions kind of need to be addressed up front. Now, I want to start by saying, if you think that I am dogmatically declaring that I am the only one that has answers to any of this, uh, no, that is not what I'm saying at all. Please see my video, What is Truth?, where I talk about truth in detail. What I'm trying to say here is that there are certain red flags that you should watch out for so that you don't get hoodwinked or deceived into paths that do not bear fruit. The first of these is that one must have a special blessing from the Most Holy in order to use the Word of God. Mm, no. No. We can talk about anointing and the anointed and all of those fun concepts in a future video. If that's something that you want, let me know down in the comments if that's the thing that you would like to hear from me. But, oh no, that, that, that is a way that televangelists and other cult leaders make themselves seem more important and distract from the purposes that we actually have in this life and our duties to God. So no, don't believe anybody who uses their ability to either read, recite, or invoke the word of God to claim superiority over you. Because uh, we, we are all equal. God is not a respecter of persons. And anybody who says that God loves them more is uh, lying. <laughs> just, just outright lying. The second misconception is that there are magic words out there that once they are known will unlock the secrets of the universe. This is one of those things that's like two lies and a truth. So the, the misunderstanding about this is that no, there is not a magical word out there that once you learn it, it will unlock all the secrets of the universe. Th that's not how magic works. That's not how anything actually works, except for in fantasy stories and fairy tales. And no, there are not magical spells out there that once rediscovered will allow us to have great power. <sighs> okay, so this misconception comes from a lot of different sources, and I, I really don't want to get into it. It is related to the third and final misconception that these words must be pronounced properly and intoned correctly or the magic will not work. Okay, so let's take these two together. A lot of the ideas here are uh, come mainly from Victorian magic and earlier, where it had become a very insular field and everyone wanted to kind of guard their own secrets and was very clear that you had to understand it their way or there, nothing good would come from it. I also see a lot of influence here from the Enochian schools of magic, and I have a lot of feelings there. And let's just suffice to say for now, I think that Enochian magic is fraught in every possible way, because a lot of it was Edward Kelly wanting to sleep with John Dee's wife. And when you actually read the experimenta, when you actually read the journals, like Edward Kelly actually talks John Dee into doing a wife swap. For a while because the angels told them to and yeah unfortunately edward kelly brings a weird cloud over all of that so mm -hmm, we're not going to go into that that's not the topic for today but mm, I, I see a lot of edward kelly's influence over this idea are there words that need to be intoned correctly for them to work yes in abalafia's system of meditation the whole point of intoning the sounds is to actually create a resonance in your own body so that you have this feeling 
moving through you so that as you intone the name of God over and over and over again, you're feeling this upwelling from the chest up and out through you or from outside in. And so it's taking advantage of the various vowels and other sounds to give you this sensation, which is actually what the word of God is all about. But we'll talk about that more in a minute. Are there words that are important to unlock the secrets of the universe? Yes, but not in the way that most people think. It's not like being able to say abracadabra properly is going to give you magical powers. So understanding the origins and meanings of that term are very important. We are incapable as a species of understanding concepts or having relationships with concepts if we do not have words for them. So merely learning words like panentheism, it opens your mind. It gives you a new understanding of the world that will help you to navigate it better. So yes, there are words that will open your mind and help you understand things better and have you have a better relationship with the world. Will they suddenly give you magical powers? If I teach you how to pronounce the divine name right now, will you be able to conquer the universe? No, that's not how that works. That's just not how that works. So when we are talking about the word of God, there, there's two distinct things that we could talk about. One, I'm going to save for a later video, and that is the actual divine person at question here, the divine wisdom, the logos, the chokmah, mother wisdom, mother love, whatever you want to call her. She appears throughout the Jewish scriptures. She appears in the Christian scriptures as the Lord Jesus Christ himself. She appears in Greek and Latin texts. Philo of Alexandria, the Jewish theologian, spends a lot of time talking about Logos, this intermediary figure. We find this figure talked about in the Targum. So yeah, there, there's a lot of places that we could go and talk about this divine figure of wisdom of the word of God. That is not our topic for today, though it is a fascinating one. If you want me to talk about it, please let me know in the comments below, and I'll definitely do a video on that. What we're talking about today is the difference between Arama and Debur, the difference between words and the enacted spoken word, the enacted word, the power of God in this world, the creative energy that flows through us, out of us, into this world to make for change. So what is that? In all of our workings, in all of our rituals, it's very important that our words be right. In other words, that they be from the heart and they be targeted towards the goal that we're wanting to have. Now we can talk more about prayer weaving and blessing weaving in future episodes, if that's something that you would like me to do. It's actually something that's on my long list of videos over there to make. But we choose our words, the actual text, very carefully so that we are stating our actual intention and using language that actually invokes within us some feeling. But the language itself is not enough. The language itself is not the most important aspect of all of this. We need to bring to it two other things for actual power to be released into this world. And those two other things are kavana or intention, and action it is the marriage of thought, word, and deed that causes this ripple in the universe that we often call magic. So how do we do that? One of the easiest ways to see this is in some of our most common blessings and purification rituals. We take water, we purify the water, we bless the water with thought, word, and deed, and then we take that water and we use it to wash and clean the things that need to be washed and cleaned with it. Thought, word, deed, all three married together in a way that is cohesive, that makes sense, that enacts the thing that we are wanting to do. Yes, pouring water over our heads does nothing to our spiritual nature because this is a material substance. But taking these three together, the intentions merge with the water. The actions bring that into us. The words flow back out of us in that run and return that we talked about previously. This is what we're actually talking about. It is the enacted word. It is the word given meaning and purpose through the cultivation of intention, focus, and effort that helps us to bring things into this world. This is why the apostle James, the brother of the Lord, said, faith without works is dead. It is. If you are merely praying for a thing to happen and not actively working for the thing to happen, uh, more than likely the thing's not going to happen. You see, it is the marriage of thought, word, and deed. I can pray, I can do the ritual work, but if I'm not actually putting the effort and work in, then we're not going to get, which causes a lot of confusion in people because I feel like 
magic is often put forward as a universal cheat code. But here, let me teach you the five magic words. But understanding everything involved in them, it, it'll change the odds in your favor. And that's what the work does. We're playing with probabilities here. We're playing with the odds of the universe. And so, as the very vulgar statement goes, if you're not in it, you can't win it. So if you're not actively trying to bring about things that you are praying for, that you are doing rituals for, then the odds that the prayers and rituals alone will affect the change that you're looking for are slim to none. This is why a true and proper understanding of Dabar is so important. It is the creative, active word of God. It is putting everything together into a story, into a digestible understanding that goes forward. Write a midrash, write a poem, write a ritual, write a prayer, perform it. Even if it's just for yourself or just for yourself and a few friends or a few people in your ritual circle, whatever it is, those actions will at bare minimum change you. It may change somebody else and it may put the ripples out into the universe that you need to get you to where you're wanting to go. But it is the enacted word. When we pray to the spirits above, we often will raise our heads, we will raise our arms. Are there actually things above us? Yes, they're called stars. They're amazing. It's all metaphor and simile. Everything that we do in the work is metaphor and simile. Because the best things there are no words for. So we talk about the second best things, and those are often misunderstood. So let your work be metaphorical. Let your actions be metaphorical. Let your words be metaphorical. Because this is the work. We are participating in the active, creative word of God. God is ever greening, ever making this world and making it new. And the most important word of God that I can teach you here is veriditas. We are looking in all things for the green wisdom, for the growing wisdom, for the growing truth, for that thing that is always there and ever greening and ever making new. Once you find that in your work, in yourself and in your life. You have done an amazing thing. And that is the true word of God. The true word of God ever speaks veriditas. It always speaks green truth. So if you are not finding that ever growing well truth, keep looking. The word of God is there. It is accessible for all of us. We just have to be honest and willing to swim in the beautiful sea of metaphors all around us to find it. And you're going to see as we go forward, we're going to start talking more and more about those metaphors. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope this made sense to you. I hope that this did help. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments down below. If there are any topics you would like me to cover, please put them in the comments down below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this video and channel respectively. It really does help me out a lot. And yeah, until next time, may the light of God ever be with you. And the Shekinah ever surround you and fill you with her glory and guard you on all the paths that you must walk. Amen.